Great. Thank you. And thank you, Sherry, and to MSH for hosting the uh, July uh, Digital Health Network monthly meeting. We're excited to hear about uh, uses of digital health applications for disease surveillance. Um, so we'll turn it over to uh, Sherry and Randy and other speakers to uh, tell us more about that in a moment. Did have two quick announcements, uh, one on the Global Digital Health Forum. Uh, as you all are likely seen through the uh, listserv and website, we are deep into the abstract review sessions, um, trying to pick out and develop the program for the December 9th through 11th event here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're excited to have an expanded event this year. We'll be uh, 600 to 700 attendees over three days, so it's really a great opportunity to come together, share, and learn more about what's going on. Um, we will be opening up registration at the end of the month, uh, so do keep a, keep a lookout for those announcements, and the tickets will go fast. We had a, a huge wait list last year, so we are anticipating a sellout, so don't, don't delay. I uh, did also want to highlight that there will be sponsorship and exhibitor opportunities available as well, so we'll be sending out that information. And uh, for anything further on that, then I did also want to announce uh, that we do have the Cape Town uh, satellite session now up and running, and they can hear us. Uh, so the uh, South Africa M Health uh, Working Group has come together and is hosting a satellite session in the, the health enabled offices, I believe. Uh, so we'll turn it over to Peter to say hello. Uh, thank you. Can you hear us? Yes, we can. Perfectly. Great. Thank you. We're actually at the Genby office. There are 15 of us oh. here. Rather than um, individually uh, listening to it, we've got together and building the digital health community in, the, um, in Cape Town. Uh, there are people here from Denby, Quaker Foundation, PAC, Stellenbosch University, UCT, Palindrome, uh, Aweza, uh, Medicine for Frontier, uh, a range of different organizations. And we've just had a discussion on some of the digital health projects going on in South Africa and delighted to be part of this meeting. Everyone else want to introduce? Okay. With that, thanks a lot, Steve. Uh, we'll come back with some questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Great. Thank you, Peter, for organizing that, and uh, welcome everyone from Cape Town. Great. And I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Randy Wilson, to get us started. Thank you, Sherry and Steve. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Randy Wilson. I've been uh, with MSH uh, working in Rwanda for the past 11 years, so I'm just fresh off the boat, as they might say. Uh, and um, happy to, to share some of our experiences on digital health, uh, particularly in the area of, uh, of disease surveillance and response. Um, so our program today, has, we have uh, three presentations. I'll, I'll pre present the first. Then uh, we have uh, our foreign correspondents, uh, one in, in Kinshasa in the DRC, uh, which, of course, is a hot spot, as we all know, for disease surveillance these days. Uh, Usman Lee with PASS. And uh, from Berlin, uh, we have Julianne, who's going to speak about another platform that uh, she's been working on um, called SORMA. Uh, then hopefully we'll have been, been able to get through most of this in record time, and there'll be time for questions and answers afterwards. Please also feel free to, to type in your questions as we go, um, and I'll be monitoring the, the, the chat. Yes, we'll, we'll try to break briefly between the presentations for any real pressing questions, but uh, if you could enter your questions mainly uh, in the chat window, uh, then we'll be able to get to the most important of those and try to get to those that we don't answer afterwards. So uh, just by way of introduction, um, the global health security context within the world has really been driving innovation, certainly over the past uh, couple of years. Um, what we, we're going to talk and, and see a bit today are three different journeys, if you like, towards the development of surveillance and response uh, tools. Um, the, the first of those are essentially uh, in, in a use case where <laughs> Rwanda, the country, was using the DHIS-2, and they said, let's transition our surveillance system into that platform that we're familiar with. Um, 
The second use case also builds on the DHIS2, uh, but focuses primarily on using it as an interoperability and visualiza data visualization tool for managing an active epidemic. So again, the context is a bit different. And the, the third uh, use case that we'll hear about is around the SORMAS platform, which was really, uh, in some ways, the Cadillac, uh, if you like, of systems built from the ground up to respond to each and every uh, sort of uh, uh, process uh, around surveillance and response. And Julianne will speak about that. Uh, let's see. As you can see there, you know, the Ebola epidemic, of course, has been one of the biggest drivers uh, for some of these systems. Uh, and it's raised the visibility of uh, epidemic diseases uh, to the highest levels. Um, and we'll hear a bit more about the actual situation in the DRC from Usman when he speaks. Um, the other thing that's important is that most countries are signatories of the international health regulations um, that require reporting on epidemic diseases. Uh, and so, you know, the, the more countries move towards automation, the more uh, it's important for them to, to consider developing a disease surveillance platform that provides real-time data. There's also uh, a realization, I think, in the countries that have been faced with epidemics such as Ebola, that the community needs to be much more engaged, not only in the response, but also to be the lookouts and to really uh, be the people to, to sound the first alarm, if you will, when there's the possibility of, of an infectious disease uh, that, that could uh, cause major um, morbidity and mortality. The other sort of part of this perfect storm, if you will, is the penetration of mobile phones and access to inter internet. Even in the most remote, remote parts of Rwanda where I've been working, uh, you can at least climb the closest hill and get uh, get internet connectivity. Um, that's not uniformly the case, as Usman will attest to in the DRC. One of their challenges is connectivity. But uh, generally speaking, the, the coverage of uh, cellular networks and the availability of phones is making a lot of these digital tools much more accessible. Now, there are many people who have sort of built platforms to support disease surveillance in one way or another. This is not a complete list by any means, but uh, as you can see, there, there are several countries working using the DHIS2 platform, EpiInfo, an early tool developed uh, through CDC, has also been applied. Uh, but there are a lot of other acronyms here, some of which I, I probably shouldn't risk trying to translate. Um, that uh, have also been used in various uh, epidemic uh, situations. <clears throat> the ones I'm going to talk to, to you about are Rwanda's uh, EIDSR, or Electronic uh, Integrated Disease Surveillance and Response System. Uh, it's, it's essentially built around the DHIS2 platform, as I mentioned. It uses both the DHIS2 aggregate reporting, which is essentially for weekly reports, of just numbers of cases um, of 24 different diseases, as well as the tracker module for immediate reports, which are uh, necessary for 20 of the diseases. And those are the ones that need to be notified at the, at the time that they're diagnosed or at least suspected. Um, we've tried to avoid, for the most part, customizing DHIS2, trying to build around the main functionality but we have had to develop custom code for the outbreak detection and for the alerts. Um, the system actually has three different uh, outbreak detection algorithms, the simplest of, of which is a case-based threshold. So you've got, you know, you can set one case of rabies, for example, a suspected case of rabies is enough to set an alert uh, for other diseases like measles, uh, it's seven or eight cases, I can't remember precisely. Um, 
then the next is basically, you know, just taking a trend over t over seven weeks uh, of time. And if your current week is more than two standard deviations above the average for the previous seven, then it says there's something going on here. Uh, and the final one, which is the, perhaps the most complex, is a seasonal one where you have diseases such as malaria that one would expect to vary uh, different times of year. And it actually does a window uh, of the previous years and then determines whether there's a, there's a substantial difference in time. So those are the, a little bit of the technicalities around that. Um, the other uh, piece of this system that we've just introduced in Rwanda is called the ESABS, or Electronic Community Event-Based Surveillance Tool. And that's essentially uh, something that uses, again, DHIS2's uh, tracker module, but using primarily SMS as the approach for uh, reporting. Um, and the idea is that we want lookouts within all of the communities in Rwanda to sound the alert if they see certain event triggers, and I'll get to, to those in a minute. We also had to develop some custom uh, code to automate the, the alert management there. Uh, just to, to give you a, a little overview of the IDSR, these first set of slides are on the IDSR. Uh, this is a fairly typical uh, approach. It's a, a, a clinical surveillance system. So basically the, the health centers and district hospitals are the levels at which diseases are, are detected and reported into the ID, EIDSR. Uh, then Rwanda Biomedical Center uh, is the, the institution within the Ministry of Health that actually uh, houses the unit that responds to and, and uh, uh, watches over um, epidemic activities. Um, and then the system uh, publishes data onto the web uh, afterwards. So reporting is done by facilities. They, as I mentioned, the outbreaks are detected by those different scripts. And then alerts of cases are sent up the hierarchy. So no, typically uh, in DHIS2, you've got a hierarchy, a pyramid hierarchy. It doesn't necessarily send to the whole country. It sort of follows the hierarchy in terms of where uh, cases are notified. Um, the aggregate reporting is what it is. It's a weekly reporting system. Uh, it's a good. It's good to have this dual source of data because, in a way, those diseases that are reported every week gives you a number that you would expect or hope that the individual reports for the same diseases would also come to the same number each each over that week period. Uh, within the uh, individual reporting, the case-based reporting, there are several stages here. There's a notification and registration, which is the first. It also has lab requests, which can be repeating, uh, lab results, which again correspond to the lab requests and are repeating, and patient status reporting every time the patient is visited. They should um, update that record to say whether the patient's health has deteriorated or, or, or improved. Um, and finally, there's a uh, contact tracing stage uh, that's still uh, in, in uh, trial phase. Uh, I think I've mentioned most of this already. Um, it has been uh, implemented uh, nationwide in Rwanda since 2014, and it's used uh, across all of the public health and uh, quite a few of the private facilities. Uh, private facilities sometimes don't have computers handy, uh, so they tend to prefer the uh, USSD interface that we've created. Um, just to give you a sense of the diseases that are reported, uh, all of these diseases are reported aggregate, whereas only the first four are reported only on the aggregate side. We don't get individual cases of diarrhea reported. It would make a, a huge uh, uh, reporting burden on people, and we don't have the ability to, to monitor and follow those uh, cases. <clears throat> we have the two interfaces. The people use the web. Uh, internet connectivity is quite good. Uh, certainly at the district level within all of the 30 districts. Um, and 
all but a few health centers in the country have uh, continuous internet connectivity. So people do prefer the web interface when they can get it. Uh, there's also, we've added, we've created a sort of custom USSD interface, which essentially allows you to fill out the form through menu-driven question and answer. Um, so those are the two options there. Uh, just a screen, quick screenshot of the case-based surveillance. Uh, basically, you know, it's vanilla tracker. There's nothing fancy about it. Uh, we we have uh, done uh, used the by the French and English uh, options uh, so that uh, users can pick whichever language they prefer. Um, but other than that, it's uh, it's pretty much standard. Uh, we've done some work on the data visualization using the, uh, the GIS module, uh, et cetera, and created a custom situation an, uh, report, CITREP report. Uh, I'll, I'll leave uh, some of the discussion around this uh, to Usman because I think they've really focused a lot on the visualization in the DRC. The second uh, piece that I wanted to talk about is this uh, community events-based surveillance system. Uh, it's really been found to be essential to get communities engaged in both the surveillance and the response to uh, outbreaks, uh, particularly like Ebola. And you know, having that those lookouts in the communities leads to a shorter response time. Uh, the other feature of the system that we've uh, focused on is that we didn't want this to be a standalone piece. We really want it to be linked to the national surveillance system. So it's actually built into the same instance of DHIS2 as uh, the EIDSR. Um, the other important piece uh, is the integration of human and animal surveillance, that one health approach, because Increasingly, as we're looking at diseases like pandemic influenza, uh, Ebola, monkeypox, etc., we've got this human and animal <coughs> factor. And sometimes, if you ignore the animal piece, you know it'll be too late. It'll be uh, within the human population quickly. So we wanted to make sure that they were both a part of this puzzle. And the other thing uh, that we wanted uh, by using the digital tools is to create a verifiable electronic record and a history and develop that sort of database of, you know, alerts over time, uh, how they're being uh, reported. Uh, just to give you a sense, obviously, if when you're talking about this, did I skip something there? Yes, I did skip something quickly here. Um, this is actually a piece of a larger um, exercise that MSA supported, which was to develop a community event-based surveillance and response toolkit, actually. Uh, this We have a, a set for the district level and a set for what the national level does uh, to, to work with the communities uh, across the country. Uh, the pieces in uh, uh, that are bold there uh, highlight uh, some of the requirements that have been uh, taken into account from this surveillance toolkit for building the ESEP. So the triggers had to be defined and tested within the communities. We identified the lookouts as the community health worker or the uh, what they call in French the agent de santé maternelle, the maternal health worker, uh, plus the village leader. Village leader plays a really important role in, uh, in all of the villages across Rwanda. And then the animal health officers. Uh, so they all are sensitized to the importance of, uh, of being lookouts for uh, these different triggers. Uh, we've identified the flow of information and reporting, et cetera. Uh, just to give you a sense of how we've defined the triggers, some of them are probably easier to detect at the community level, but the first was serious or unexplained or unusual illness and or death. That appears contagious. So it's not it's it's not just one person dying or one person getting very sick. <coughs> it's usually a cluster. So we need a, greater than two people within a week. And often the focus is on people who are living in close proximity. So that's where we get the contagious element of it. Uh, the other uh, piece among animals is that sudden or unexpected health problem among animals. So 
bird uh, flocks of uh, chickens dying off, uh, et cetera. Those are the kinds of things that, that are reported. Um, since Rwanda is right next to DRC, and in fact, there was a case recently in Goma, which is just, you know, 100 meters across uh, from, uh, from the border from uh, one of the big cities in Rwanda. Um, people have been sensitized to Ebola and the symptoms of Ebola. So they, the IDSR people said, let's add Ebola. It's obviously going to be nonspecific, but at least people are aware, and we need to keep them, uh, have them be our eyes and ears for this as well. And then the last is kind of a catch-all, uh, anything that they think could be one of the epidemic-prone diseases, but we haven't really focused on training people on that yet. Uh, the way this works is very much like uh, rapid SMS. So for those of you who are familiar with the, these SMS uh, reporting tools, um, it, it, they, each of the uh, lookouts has a cheat sheet similar to this. In fact, they want to put it on a plasticized card so that they can have it with them at any time. And they create these messages using, for example, the first column there, event notification, would, uh, would require a NTF as a start. And then uh, the trigger that they, they are reporting, human illness, human death, et cetera, and then reports cases. You can see some sample mes messages formatted at the bottom. Um, and then the last column is, is the confirmation. The confirmation <coughs> is actually done by somebody at the health center or the district hospital. So they're responsible for following up on these alerts to, to determine whether or not they're worth investigating or whether they're considered a false alarm. Um, and then, of course, the data gets into the DHIS2, just like any other tracker uh, information. Uh, and can be analyzed and viewed. Uh, so just ending up here with uh, some of the challenges and uh, what, what has come up as possible solutions for them in Rwanda. We still have quite a big problem with the EIDSR closing the laboratory confirmation loop uh, because people request lab tests, they get sent off to the national lab, but often they're not getting back into the system. So we have a lot of suspected cases and more suspected cases and more, but, but very few that are actually confirmed. So we've been working for some time now on developing some interoperability with the lab system so that those uh, results can automatically come back in and confirm or, or not confirm the cases. Um, the other piece is just a behavior change issue primarily uh, when an active outbreak is ongoing, uh, people are, are good at finding cases and reporting them, but actually going back and visiting them, first of all, whether or not that's happening is a question, but certainly what's not happening is that they're not often putting the daily follow-up that's required for diseases like cholera, Ebola, et cetera, like that. So, so it's, it's really a question of compliance with the reporting requirements. And we've built into the system now some reminders if there's a case that's been suspected and for two days there, there's no, uh, no information come in to confirm or deny that the case, then we'll send an automated reminder to the person who reported to, to do the follow-up. So, um, The other challenge is financial resources. Uh, we haven't had enough funds to purchase tablets or smartphones for the uh, the EIDSR focal people in all of the health centers and hospitals uh, who would be doing contact tracing. Uh, so here's to hoping perhaps that, you know, this worry about Ebola will generate some more support from uh, outside primarily. Uh, and also uh, we found, uh, as Usman as, uh, <clears throat> will attest to, that there are some difficulties using the uh, Android DHIS2 application offline. Uh, so we're hoping that upgrades will make sure that. Other areas, these are common across any, anybody who uses DHIS2 is that it's, it's such a moving target. The platform gets updated so frequently and with great features requested by all the users, but each time you have to real, think about, will it break what the special code that we've developed to, to perform other related functions and, 
so we've actually focused on building a local capacity, a, DH, uh, a, a HISP Rwanda organization that actually is supporting that so now that our project has ended there. And then rolling out this uh, community-based surveillance is a challenge as well. Whereas one system, we need to train around 900 people. With the ESEBs, we're talking about tens of thousands of people that need to be trained across the country. It's not a very big training, but it still uh, it requires resources. So the focus is really around the border areas right now to deal with the uh, the expected threat uh, from the D uh, from uh, DRC. So, uh, and I think that's where I will end mine. I'm going to switch quickly over. Yeah, and we had a couple questions okay. come in. If we can just do a couple Perfect. quick questions. Uh, so the first was, why did uh, the team create the ESIBs in the SMS requiring a cheat sheet rather than using USSD uh, with a menu when you already had uh, other experience using USSD? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, I think it was down to resources uh, at the time we were doing it, uh, the ESEBs. We decided initially, this was fully funded by MSH, not funded through our project. Uh, that we would get the SMS piece working and then we would adapt the USSD afterwards. We did have some issues in Rwanda in particular, it may be common elsewhere, <laughs> with timeouts for the USSD. <clears throat> so if people get, didn't get their messages uh, prepared uh, or at, respond to the prompts quickly enough, there was a, sometimes a timeout and then they had to go back and, and, and restart the, the message queue. Uh, so. Those were two factors that, that uh, built into our discussion. And the second question was, while closing the gap on lab results, what approach did you use? Did you enhance lab <coughs> systems to send notifications, or did you custom code, uh, did you develop custom code to pick data from existing lab systems? Uh, I guess the answer is both, actually. <laughs> we, we worked, the, the national lab there is using a system called Labware, which is apparently used quite broadly in big labs. Uh, and we had them write a script to essentially uh, drop results into a, a folder on their server. Then we had to write some code on our side that would pull those results back into the DHIS2 uh, and import them in uh, through the API. So we had to work on both sides uh, in order to get it, uh, get it working. Okay. Uh, if anybody has additional questions, just keep note of those, and we'll do a group uh, Q&A session uh, following all three uh, presentations. Great. Okay, so now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Usman Lee, who is the Digital Health Advisor for PATH, uh, working with the Ministry of Health in the Demo Democratic Republic of Congo. Congo. So, Usman, can, can we hear you? Can you hear us? Yes, I hear you. Thank you very much, uh, Randy. Okay. Great. Just uh, be sure to let me know when you want me to change slides. Okay, thank you. It's a pleasure for me to talk uh, today about our Emergency Operating Center for Ebola Response in Democratic uh, Republic of Congo and the uh, digital tools used in the outbreak, uh, like a uh, DHS2. Next slide. Okay, um, in this case, um, my, my presentation is focused on DRC Ebola outbreak status to, to today, uh, not today, in the three days ago. I have a today uh, situation that is not fixed by the Ministry of Earth, so I have not uh, authorization to share it. Uh, it will be shared after uh, 3 p.m. Uh, DRC time. Operationalization of DRC EOC and challenges using digital health tools for surveillance. Next slide. Okay. Um, in this uh, tense uh, Ebola outbreak in DRC, we have uh, uh, coordination response activities uh, led by the Minister of Health uh, and its partner from EUC in, uh, at the epicenter of uh, outbreak in Beni, and we have a uh, provincial coordination of EUC in Goma 
and the national EUC uh, in Kinshasa. Um, EUC of Kinshasa is has enabled creation of an epidemiological data visualization dashboard for real-time monitoring on the GHS2 platform. This integration has contributed to the interoperability and interconnectivity of epidemiologic surveillance data with the National Health Information System. is based on uh, DHS2. At Friday, the 19th July 2019, other event is uh, since the beginning of the epidemic, the cumulative number of cases is more than 2,500. Uh, People, which we have uh, 2,000 more than 2,400 are confirmed, uh, and uh, 19.4 percent are probable. In the total, we have uh, 1,700 deaths. In this 1,700 deaths, we have 1,600 1, confirmed and 9.4 is probable. We have uh, actually more than 400 suspect cases in the investigation. And we have uh, 14 new confirmed cases, including six from Beni, five in Mandima, one in Katwa, one in Mabalako, and one in Mambasa. 10 new confirmed cases deaths six community deaths, two in Bini, two in Manima, one in Mavalako, and one in Mambasa. In the CTE deaths, we have four, two in Butembo, one in Katwa, and one in Mavalako. Three people carried out of city in Bini. This is uh, the picture of the address and last Friday. Next uh, slide. And mobile UC at Beni and Goma give quick response in the Minister of Health for leadership. We have a Kinshasa EUC was initially planned for use as data management and visualization center, but its function was focused only on data visualization today. And uh, we have uh, in Goma and Beni near of the outbreak epicenter, our team working uh, with all partners uh, to give uh, real-time data for the uh, control. Next slide. What tools we have uh, using now? Use uh, for uh, for mapping ArcGIS uh, and ArcGIS only online mapping software. We have DHS2 data war software, EWARS alert notification software, this is in the uh, WHO side, mobile application DHS2 tracker, but we can see the failure of these tools, uh, Comcare contact tracing platform, Android smartphone and tablet, uh, and uh, we work with common geographic reference team of DLC, this is uh, all people working on the uh, GIS uh, uh, activities in the DLC. Open set map uh, DLC team also, and we use VSAT and Telcos network for internet access and communication access. We have uh, operat operating room with visualization facilities in uh, Kinshasa. We have this uh, in, the, in the picture on the slide, and uh, we have a daily video conferencing tools, and we all uh, all morning, uh, EOC in Kinshasa is uh, in, the, in the video conferencing in real time with uh, Goma and Butembo and uh, Beni. And we have uh, some time also uh, a video conference with uh, top level. One is uh, with uh, CDC uh, director, uh, Dr. Redfall, and one with uh, uh, director. This is the uh, information flow chart uh, we use on the, this outbreak. We have a sentinel site surveillance. We have an early warning system of 8 minutes by 
immediate uh, notification with NGO church. Uh, we have a response proposed uh, uh, by UN organization also and provincial surveillance system like uh, district uh, system, zone system, and and uh, facilities. All this information is coming in the EOC and the epidemiological units. And you track information and we send to the CNC, this is the National Coordination Committee of the outbreak. Next slide. And uh, we have a, a community-based uh, uh, alert system and we use in this uh, uh, in this uh, side all uh, of uh, possibilities uh, uh, offered by uh, the system, and this is a new a new uh, a, a new uh, I mean it's a new action offered by PATH in this uh, outbreak. We are going in the community to work with uh, students and the teacher uh, be because this outbreak is very, very, very uh, complicated. It's very hard to uh, to control this uh, outbreak. And uh, uh, at this work, uh, we are a student in the in the school and uh, and uh, teacher and in the family, and uh, we have. Uh, Action to, 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 to do surveillance of the, of the outbreak and going all information in the district level and going to the, uh, our EOC in the, in the outbreak region. Next slide. And this is a slide to show you what the national health information is implementing and use of DHS to. We have some. Uh, kind of uh, dashboard is coming from our routine data, GIS tools, uh, event, uh, even notification by UAS, uh, tracking, and tasks, and we put all this uh, information on the DHS dashboard or, uh, for decision making. Next slide, you can see. And that is uh, one of uh, DHS tools dashboard of uh, uh, surveillance side, you have an uh, alert notification, you have uh, uh, some information about uh, uh, contact uh, tracing listed and uh, uh, when you lost some, some people in the contact tracing side, that is a dashboard uh, and you see when it's not good, it's in the red. Next slide. Our main success in this uh, outbreak is uh, to use uh, map. And uh, on this uh, uh, slide, you see the, when the, the outbreak uh, uh, starts in Beni, it is just Mabalako one red point. And uh, six months later, you see you have a, 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 a Outbreak is spread in Mabalako, Beni, Kalungula. And when you, you see actually in July, uh, you, you see it's not very good. The, the outbreak is not under control at this time. And uh, what is the reason of this, uh, uh, this challenge? It's a security issues in this, uh, in this zone. Next slide. And uh, yes, uh, use of uh, digital map is very helpful uh, to see where is exactly the problem. And uh, uh, we think when you, you show our result in the tableau on a graph, uh, no. When you show with uh, uh, map, it's very, very, very uh, significant for political people to take decision immediately because you say where area is affected in the real time. Next slide. Uh, 
about a challenge. In the global challenge, logistic is, issues is uh, working in the middle of a forest. In the, some time in the, uh, in the park of Virungiza, you're traveling uh, to take three hours to, uh, to, to get uh, information in certain health zone. And we have a social behavioral communication with the host community, including my, my population and rebel factor. Uh, it's very uh, difficult to, uh, to, 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 to sensibilize these people. Coordination among the multiple uh, partners. We have a very lack of coordination between NGOs and international agencies uh, on the ground. And uh, data-driven decision making management uh, need to be consolidated. Database and sensory tools using data from multiple sources. We have a uh, ministry of health have DHS2 and uh, versus WHO EORs. And uh, today the two tools are not interoperable. This is a very challenge. Need to have a key performance indicator data. When you go in the ground, you have some uh, projects, some NGO collects many, many, many indicators. And uh, hey, but it's a, 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 a hard work uh, for for the health worker, and it's very difficult. So data expression in a coordination level and uh, late decision establishing some sub coordination like uh, Bitumbo one big EP center. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. Okay. It should be we have. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I think we have some uh, delay late with uh, internet uh, access between uh, DRC and the international side. That is the reason. Logistic issues is IT equipment and local providers have not a good quality and cost is very higher. Uh, because we have decided uh, for our deployment of DHS2 tracker to buy all equipment uh, in the uh, in the with local uh, equipment provider and 50% uh, of uh, mobile or and tablet is not working well. Uh, communication issues. Visa is not functional sometimes and very expensive. And telcos network don't get sufficient internet bandwidth. That is the problem. Coordination among multi partners, I have very lack coordination between uh, uh, Ministry of Health, NGO, and international agency. And uh, for digital tools side, you need to consider database and standardize tools using data from uh, multiple sources. Uh, I have, say, Ministry of Health, DHS2 versus WHOs, versus OCHA, Tambu, etc. And uh, uh, the big, the big, big issues is uh, don't use any tool if it is not mature. Like DHS2 Android take uh, app on mobile phone or, or Comcare, or, uh, I, I, I show you on the next slide. Next slide. That is uh, the example of uh, failure of use of tracker application. We have a, a bug in uh, the mobile app in DHS2 uh, in the offline because it's not possible to use real time for inter lack of internet in the rural area. And you use uh, offline uh, 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 capability of uh, uh, DHS2 uh, uh, tracker. And is not working when you put a m m sum of, of uh, data in, and in the time to then, the system bug it. That is the reason. And for uh, Comcare, uh, Comcare working very well with uh, BI, but Minister of Health has not a business intelligence license. And uh, we are talking about interoperability with DHS2. It's pending status now. That is uh, some of our problem with uh, contact tracing tools in the uh, ground. Next slide.
In conclusion, we think uh, collaboration, sharing, inclusion of all stakeholders in the key is the key to success and sustainability. Because it's not interesting to deploy tools just for the outbreak, and at the end of the outbreak, you go and the country don't use these tools. It's uh, the same case in some uh, country in West Africa during the uh, Ebola outbreak. And uh, integration and interoperability of digital food in eIDSL is very important, uh, we think. DSS2 is mature for visualization of IDSL data, but the mobile app is not yet mature enough. And we think time is counting down. The country is facing the 10th Ebola outbreak in North Korea province since 1st August 2008. And the situation is upgraded on global emergence level now. Fighting zone with whip of rebel attack is a big challenge. And we are uh, waiting for all uh, uh, proposal about use on over side to, to know how is the movement of the population in this area? Because it's not possible to make correctly contact tracing due uh, security issues of uh, health worker in this area. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm available for all questions. Thank you, Usman. Uh, we have one question come through. Uh, on the WebEx, and that is, does the DHIS2 act as a collecting source of information from other tools, for example, from ComCare contact tracing, or are the informa is, it, is the information treated separately for each system? Yes, unfortunately, uh, the information is uh, treated separately. And we put after the result on our GHS2 uh, data warehouse. Why? Because ComCare uh, contact tracing is implemented by uh, UNFPA. And uh, that is one of the reasons of lack of coordination and uh, uh, interoperability. Operability. And when you test uh, ComCare, we have not to see whose concept can give directly, automatically, data in the DHS2 today. But Thank you. if you have uh, experience, we are waiting to see. Thank you. And the second question that's coming from the Cape Town uh, group is, does the system collect data on Ebola vaccination? Is that being tracked systematically? Yeah, that is also, that is also a, a, a big issue. You know, at this outbreak, the vaccination and immunization is uh, managed by MSF and Alima. And you use another system. You don't know what system he used. He gives us only on the Excel format uh, vaccination data. And we put uh, from this Excel format in the DHS2. But vaccination information is collected by MSF and Alima on the ground. Thank you very much, Usman. Do we have any questions here in the room at this time? Uh, Sorry. Thank you. Well, yeah, one from Moses. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, maybe a quick clarification, Randy, from your presentation. That especially we look at the, you know, the EODCR. At what scale did you implement that? Was that at national scale, or you had some kind of facilities that covered that? That's yeah. One. The second, probably, uh, what solution did you use, especially uh, linking data from the lab system and the DHS two? Okay. All right. So yes, it was the IDSR has actually been rolled out even since before. Uh, uh, nationally, mm -hmm. of course, Rwanda has the advantage of scale being small. Yeah, small. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, it's implemented in all public facilities and all private uh, 
sort of uh, clinics have been trained. Uh, the reporting rates are a bit lower from them, uh, as would be expected, but uh, basically it's been rolled out nationally. Uh, in terms of the interfaces on the, uh, between the DHIS2 and the labware system, yeah. on the DHIS2, we were able to just use the API yeah. and collect data uh, as a CSV file and push it into uh, the DHIS2. On the labware side, it's a SQL Server system that didn't have at the time a robust API, so they actually had to write a script mm -hmm. that created those CSV files and put them into a folder. Before that. Then we had a approach of just pulling the the other server to try to pull it through an FTP. Track. So that yeah. data actually wasn't like automated, but later like on liquid. It, yeah, it required a, a pull. A I mean, pull it, it was scheduled as a cron job, schedule. but but it. Uh, so it wasn't the kind of not real time automation. In any case. Okay. Right. We're getting a few more questions in, but I think we'll hold some of them until the end for Usman. Usman, one one question that I think is, uh, maybe you can uh, answer this right now, and then we'll hold the rest for the end. Was if we could go back two years in time, what advice would you have? You, you explained a lot of the challenges with. Uh, interoperability and coordination. If you could go back two years, what advice would you give to lay better foundations for interoperability and, and system coordination? Okay. When I'm go I'm go back two years, I this is my my voice. I'm talking about don't say your your tool is interoperable if it is not really interoperable. And we see, when you, 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 you say, my tool is interoperable, you do real test of interoperability before coming on the ground of the outbreak. And this is the question we are. He was not, doesn't exist today. We have, he was five years ago. We have a, Come care five years ago. We have uh, all tools is coming. In a, we have five years ago. The tool is existing. Today, when you talk about your tools is interoperable with DHS2 or Anova, you say yes. But when you go in the ground and you you test it, it is not okay. That is the problem. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go on to the third presentation now, and then we'll come back for some more questions at the end. Okay, great. It's uh, now my pleasure to introduce, introduce uh, Julianne Dorbecker. She is uh, with the Helmholtz Center for Infection Research in Berlin. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting her during the World Health uh, Summit in uh, Berlin last year. Uh, and she's going to present to us around uh, their platform that they've developed and implemented in several countries. So, Julianne, can you on? Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yes, I would like to present to you today SOMAS, uh, the Surveillance Outbreak Response Management and Analysis System. And it was uh, developed. Sorry, I'm still with the first page. It was developed um, with uh, um, in cooperation with the Nigerian uh, Center for Disease Control and the Helmholtz Center for Infection Research. Gerard Krause, um, working as a leader in this project, uh, in this regards, unfortunately today he cannot be here. Um, they started developing it in response to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And right now we have a team in uh, Germany at the HZI here in Braunschweig. Um, with me is uh, my colleague Bernard Sidenu and Daniel Tom Abba. And we have another team, Thomas team in Nigeria and uh, starting now in Ghana. And um, yes, on the next slide, you can already see the um, objectives of Thomas, so key characteristics. It, is, um, it has full integration of uh, outbreak response and uh, infectious disease surveillance. So these two characteristics are in the system. It is case-based and bidirectional, uh, which also refers to the task management uh, within SOMAS. So there's um, a fixed communication pathways with tasks attached uh, in the system, for example, for contact tracing. It is 
operable without continuous electricity or internet, and also open source and free of charge. On the next slide now, you will see um, the integrated disease surveillance and response system, IDSR, um, and the conventional information flow as it was and is still in parts of Nigeria uh, before SOMOS was implemented. Uh, so right now we have the two systems, so to say, side by side. And as most of you know, um, there's a um, healthcare facility level where data are sent in an aggregated fashion and a, a weekly and uh, to the next level, the uh, LGA level, and uh, then further the data are sent on the next day, also again aggregated to the higher level and so on, uh, until to the NCDC and also if uh, required monthly to the WHO. There's also immediate case-based reporting um, by phone or text messages if it is required. And as you already see, there's a lot of energy and effort to do the reporting, of, and still it's uh, aggregated, uh, lacking some information this way. And also um, the challenge is uh, we are not talking about like the timeliness, because we are now not talking about minutes to uh, inform different levels, but we talk about days and weeks uh, to inform them about uh, certain infectious disease cases. And um, when we now on the next slide, you will see uh, how SOMAS uh, goes into the system. So uh, the different um, healthcare personnel, which is um, responsible for uh, various tasks, get a tablet or a laptop on each level, and they then can not do their uh, work on a paper-based or Excel-based fashion, but they can put their information directly into SOMAS, and um, these information are then put into the server which you can see on the uh, right corner. Um, and the information are then uh, transmitted in real time to the people who need these, uh, meaning uh, an hospital informant can put a case into SOMAS and then the, the person who has to validate this directly gets the information as soon as there's internet available and the synchronization happens. And there's also an, a laboratory uh, interface involved. Um, I come to this and uh, by Introducing this, this digital way, um, the, the conventional system, so to say, was maybe improved, optimized, if you want to say so. Um, at least the, the timeliness uh, was uh, improved and there's case-based um, information transmission, uh, which is naturally for a surveillance system, um, depending on the disease, uh, highly important. And um, now looking on the next slide, you will see the different personas uh, within uh, SOMAS. These are, were developed based on the uh, Nigerian system, so people, personnel, which is already in place in the country, working um, in this area. And uh, in SOMAS now, um, you can see always uh, in bold and black, the names of these um, personas which are in SOMAS and in red, uh, what would be the position called uh, within Ni in Nigeria, um, already indicating that SOMAS was developed based on the existing system, so we didn't invent anything new here. We actually just wanted to improve or um, support the system already in place. And you see here um, personas or personnel important for the detection, which is, for example, the hospital informant, and here also um, the event-based surveillance comes into place. Then you see uh, personas uh, involved in the validation and analysis of cases, controls, and outbreaks. Here, the surveillance officer is uh, an example. And you see uh, personas involved in the control, so the isolation, treatment, and follow-up, for example, rather important also for Ebola cases. Um, on the next slide, you will see actually the um, flow within SOMAS. So you see the people again, um, or the personas responsible for detection. Uh, one example is a hospital informant. You would create a case uh, within SOMAS, and these information are then transferred to the surveillance officer who will validate if this is a real case. And uh, the laboratory um, people are informed about their task, that there's a new test um, which needs to be done and then they can put the information into the system again so that the relevant people are informed 
if uh, the test was negative or positive. And uh, on the left side, again, uh, in the area of detection, you see that we also um, had to look at the event-based surveillance so that this is also taken care of, so to say. Uh, the information are then, um, in case of Ebola, it would be important if this is an Ebola case that the person is um, isolated, uh, which would be the task of the case uh, personnel, so supervisor and officer. Um, and contact tracing, there's a special uh, part in Zormas also where the contact tracing is taken care of, uh, where the persona's contact officer and contact supervisor come into place. And in the next slide, you will see uh, that again, as I mentioned before, this information are then um, are always transferred to the server uh, and in real time, and then um, the information can be brought back to the personas needing this. Um, as you will see on the next slide, when the arrows go back to, for example, laboratory person. Um, yes, you will see on the next slide that there's, um, yes, thank you. Um, that the information that, for example, the laboratory person will put in the information that the test was um, performed and the result will then be transferred to the hospital informant or, for example, whoever needs this information. Um, on the next slide now, you will see, um, I don't expect you to read all these uh, small little um, yeah, yellow boxes or anything, but this is just an example for the process model for Ebola virus and the contact follow-up, how many different um, processes are involved, and for each of those we had to define what happened in this case, in this scenario, and this is all standing behind this uh, maybe in the beginning rather simple looking uh, flow of information. So this is only one small aspect of it, just to give you an idea. If you look now on the next slide, you will see um, that there are different disease specific process models. We have them now for 12 diseases. Most of them you can see here, like Ebola, for example, are already incorporated into the system. For others, they are still in planning, um, and we or we started to consider them. And as you see, um, depending on the disease, there are certain characteristics uh, to consider. Ebola, as I mentioned, contact follow-up is rather important. In case of measles, for example, there's vaccination available, so this should be also considered. Um, vector control in case of dengue environmental sanitation um, in regard to cholera. Uh, specifically, we also have an emerging disease X um, within SOMAS. So when there's a new disease which is not yet um, defined, so to say, this is a module where we can really quickly um, shape it according to this disease uh, to be also prepared, um, so to say, for the unknown. And um, on the next slide, I just have a bit more information about the different aspects, so contact follow-up. As most of you know, um, this process management um, of the control measures, um, so you have to um, search of a contact person, symptom moni monitoring, and quarantine at home. So this effort, like takes a lot of um, time and it's important. So we have certain tasks within SOMAS uh, which kind of remind the person to do this. And um, then there are other aspects um, which are important to these different um, measures, so to say. We do not have all of them incorporated in SOMAS, but we considered them when we developed the disease-specific process models. Um, so I just show them here, preventive treatment, vector control, veterinarian control, vaccination, and uh, environmental sanitation. And for example, also when you have um, in SOMAS, um, when you put in this is a suspected Ebola case into the system, you will see um, that the system asks you if the person had contact with, for example, um, uh, or was uh, visiting a funeral, for example. So could you uh, go to the next slide? Here you see actually um, the different overlaps we see SOMAS has. Uh, so this is referring to the technical and the organizational interoperability of SOMAS. 
and uh, the data um, which are um, collected um, in SOMAS in Nigeria, in the country, uh, these data belong to the country itself and um, they also decide how to uh, work with them, what to do with them, where are they, where they are stored. And so, for example, if the Ministry of Health in Nigeria, the NCDC, so the responsible um, institution in the country, decides to um, submit them or to send them to the WHO, Africa CDC, um, they can do it in this way. Then um, we have the technical area. So I mentioned before, we have a laboratory interface within SOMAS which is not going as far as the laboratory information management system. Um, it's more on the surface, so to say, um, because there are already really good sub, um, systems in place, so we do not want to, want to um, stick to what we are good at, um, which is epidemiology. And, um, but uh, nevertheless, we have a laboratory interface. Um, then naturally, there's also um, DHIS2 to consider and other systems. Um, just to give you an overview about um, different uh, interoperabilities. Could you go to the next slide, please? Here you see actually um, how the implementation in Nigeria started. Uh, in November 2017, a monkeypox uh, outbreak um, occurred in the country. And uh, in response to this, SOMAS was deployed in eight states and 33 districts. So the states are here depicted in blue and the districts in yellow. Where, and uh, to actually uh, respond to this outbreak um, using SOMAS. And uh, on the next slide, you will see uh, actually the situation um, in May 2019. Uh, in response to a Lassa fever outbreak and a meningitis outbreak happening in Nigeria, SOMAS was deployed in 12 states. Um, it is now in 190, or in May, it was in 196 um, districts deployed. And this is uh, where SOMAS is in continuous operation. It is in 92 health facilities and 11 laboratories. And currently, uh, 538 users uh, are continuously are working with SOMAS. Um, you can see here um, also the uh, health facilities and so on depicted. So now um, we are also in communication with Ghana. In November, uh, a design thinking workshop uh, was um, happened where we had a look at actually uh, what adjustments are necessary uh, for ZOMAS um, to get piloted in the country. Uh, it was realized that there are only minor adapt adaptations necessary, and they also um, asked for an untracked and rabies-specific disease module. And uh, the idea is now to pilot ZOMAS in two regions of Ghana. Uh, this is all happening, or it's planned to, ha to be happening in the framework of a private-public partnership with the Ghana Health Service and GCNet, which is a software company situated in Ghana and the Helmholtz Center for Infection Research, and GLZ has been um, support and funding in uh, some of these uh, procedures I explained. Um, yes, could you go to the next slide, please? Here you see the technology stack of SOMAS. Um, I will try to answer questions to this as good as I can, but I might just refer to the IT in this regard. Uh, it, we recently moved to OpenStreetMap, and um, all the codes and roadmaps are available on GitHub. Yes, I think I leave it to like this, but uh, as I said before, uh, questions are welcome if you have further on this. Um, yes, please. Yes, so I guess you're all aware um, about the global good maturity model for digital health software. Uh, in this slide, we actually try to visualize it a bit and the criteria to um, rank the maturity of a health software um, regarding global utility, community support, and software maturity. And um, on the next slide now, you will see actually, um, we started with SOMAS, the open source version of SOMA. Um, no, we started with SOMA, sorry, open source SOMA in July 2016. And um, then we um, are now in July 2019, and we are happy to say that for the majority of those in this 
uh, in Dormas, we are now at 100% regarding to global utility, community support, and software maturity. And this already brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, in this project, there are different, uh, different institutions, different organizations involved, you will see on the next slide, um, but there are even further, which I cannot um, all mention here. Um, we have, as I said, three different teams working on this. Um, you see here on the picture the dashboard, uh, which is at the NCDC in Nigeria. And we have a homepage, a website, uh, somas.org, where you can also have a look at SOMAS itself. There's a play version with no real data, but you can see how the dashboard looks like and also how it is to create a case in SOMAS, uh, which you will get access through the SOMAS website. Uh, please feel free also to contact us. Uh, you see our email address here, and um, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you okay. very much. And you have a number of questions already that, um, that your great presentation has generated, so I'm going to share a, a couple of the ones that have come through. Uh, so since SORMAS was developed based on the custom Nigeria surveillance structures, how easy is it to then uh, adjust it for other contexts for implementation in other countries? And what are the plans for continued support and development of SORMAS? So um, as SORMAS is, uh, was developed based on IDSR, uh, and we realize now in Ghana that only minor um, adaptations were necessary to adjust SORMAS to the country, as a lot of African countries are using IDSR. So it's not, at the moment, it does not seem too complicated. Naturally, every country is different. Um, but based on our experiences from Ghana, this seems to be not too um, challenging. We're also currently translating SOMAS into French and to also um, consider French-speaking countries. And uh, con concerning maintenance, so we are currently um, having a stable SOMAS version in the country, we are still um, taking care of um, if there are immediate um, changes, if there are changes required from the field, so to say. We are in close uh, contact with um, Nigeria when they do their deployments. We have, um, and our software company, which is uh, working with us. And uh, we are, so to say, also looking into. Um, you know, Increasing also the infectious disease modules in SOMA. Thank you. The, the next question uh, gives an example. In Liberia, the government piloted an offline laptop tablet based app for EIDSR. Even with offline entry, we found it very difficult to maintain because of laptop viruses, price of maintaining hardware, etc. In another case, the software developers for another app left without providing the code to the government. Does SORMAS have a way to address these types of challenges? So SORMAS is um, all the code. Everything is freely like it's available on GitHub. It is there. Um, right now, the laptops and tablets which are in place are dedicated only for SORMAS, which means uh, in regard to um, viruses and so on, this are just working laptops. Um, they are not, there shouldn't be any other applications um, on these laptops. And um, we are also kind of working in close communication with countries, um, trying to uh, get, like, get to their needs, so to say. In, in, the, in the way we can, we can uh, like, in what is in our power, so to say, naturally, we are also um, depending on funding and so on. But um, uh, we, we try to, to help and um, support. Um, as I said, um, the, the code is freely available as well. Uh, as uh, those of you online may have seen in the chat, Amanda Bendor shared that uh, SORMAS is an approved global good through the Digital Square Notice process. Uh, and there's also a, a video link shared there of the of a new SORMAS video on how the system works. Um, one other question was regarding uh, many locations having a lack of network connectivity and um, difficult to reach. 
have you thought of alternative ways to transmit outbreak information and data to include in SORMAS? Um, so, um, so, in SORMAS, so in SORMAS, you need to, um, if there's no internet available, you can still work with the tablet. You put in the information and you um, synchronize as soon as the internet is available again. We are currently also working on um, some, some idea to uh, work when in areas where there's actually really never ever internet available, so to say, um, or really often not internet available. Okay, thank you. We have um, just under 10 minutes left. Um, the next question is to anyone, so maybe I'll see if, if Brandy wants to um, answer on, on something like this. So uh, the question is for on any of the systems, how do the systems link data at different points to the correct individual? What identifiers and verifiers are used? Um, then he notes that good clinical practice compliance requires strong audit logging. Have there been efforts to implement this? Great question. Um, yeah, I think, you know, all of this really ties into a couple of comments made uh, by, by both of the, my co-presenters around not developing a system just for use during an outbreak and then having it go away. I think these have to fit into an ecosystem of software and applications um, which, which support interoperability. And that, that would require some kind of a client registry, for example, which those of, those of us who've been working in uh, interoperability with the health and, uh, information exchanges and things like that have been trying to put in place and have succeeded in some measure in some context. Um, but I think that that's the key is really to put in place uh, uh, an, either a national ID system, uh, which extends perhaps beyond the health sector uh, that, uh, that allows um, quick and easy uh, lookups of, of unique uh, individual identifiers and uh, building the system around that client registry or that uh, national ID system. Um, I suspect, and I think uh, speaking at least for the DHIS2 in Rwanda, we've started to use that, but only for uh, one of the systems that we're using for a nutrition uh, program where uh, the actual uh, feeding uh, packets are are given for free to people who meet a certain uh, income uh, category, and they need to look up that unique ID in order to determine whether or not the person and the family is eligible. So we've built that into the challenge too with the national ID system, uh, but we're not using it in the uh, in the surveillance module at this point. So um, I'm not sure. Maybe Julianne could could. Uh, address whether or not in Nigeria they've linked to a, a unique uh, national identifier? Uh, one moment, please. Uh, I'm just discussing with my colleague for a moment. <laughs> okay, all right. Yes, uh, Randy, I don't quite get you right, but if you create a well, case in SOMA, for example, there's a unique identifier that the database generates. Each entity has the identifier. When, when you add a new individual, are you forced to go and, and look into a national database first to see if that person already exists, has an ID, and pull up their identification information? Oh, okay, we have a search at the front end where if you want to create a case, because in SOMAS, you can create a case at various levels. A lab person can create a case. Somebody at the hospital can secrete a case. It depends on the person who first come to the notion of the case. So if you try to create a case, if it's the same name, then the system automatically will have a search algorithm that try to identify duplicate. So when it identifies a duplicate, then the person can decide if it is a duplicate or not. If it's not a duplicate, then the system automatically generates a unique identifier code. Great. So that's that, a kind of yeah. internal, making sure that whatever the entry yeah. is, that, that yeah. you have a unique uh, ID for that. Uh, unique identifier, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Also generates EPID number sometimes. It depends if the country wants to configure it automatically. 
It generates a unique identifier, and in addition to that, the EPID number based on the district and so on. Okay. But they can put it off if they don't want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's also possible to put it's also possible to put the EPID number yeah. manually if I understand correctly. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I know just to let you know we're unfortunately not gonna get to all of the questions, I don't think, because they keep coming in, but we will be sharing them with all of the presenters and, and make sure that that gets included as well um, in the post back out. Um, a question on, Randy, you, you mentioned that uh, for the EIDSR, uh, even a number of the private facilities are using that. And I think that's been a challenge that a lot of um, uh, systems have faced in terms of how do you get buy-in from, from private sector facilities? How did you make that, how did that work in, in Rwanda's case? Um, I guess there's really two approaches. One is, of course, to invite them to participate in all of the trainings uh, in an integrated way initially. And then we actually did for the private facilities, a special training through the private medical association uh, just for, for their members. Uh, so, so capacity building, you know, and a cup of coffee and a lunch and things like that uh, can go a long way to, to helping with compliance. Uh, the, other, the other piece of it is, I think, I can't stress enough the importance of having the immediate case-based reporting and the weekly reporting, because it's it's very feasible, practical, and possible for people never to have a case to, to report over three, four, five, six weeks. Mm -hmm. But they essentially do need to do a zero reporting uh, every week uh, if they're if they're not whether they're reporting or not, and and uh, so that gives you a check to make sure that people are actually using the system uh, at all. And if uh, we often see uh, a difference between the number of cases that are the, the aggregate cases that are reported and the number of individual cases, well, then we would also we we analyze that data and we provide some feedback to them and say, you know, why did you report, you know, three cases of typhoid uh, in the aggregate, but you only reported one, you know, case-based uh, uh, surveillance case of that? So. Um, there, there are some tools for, for doing that. Um, I think to to really promote um, compliance, particularly in the weekly reporting, that idea of issuing a, a SMS reminder mm. to the person of record from that facility who normally does the data entry uh, when they get to a day after, you know, 24 hours after the, the, the time, the Monday noon when they're supposed to report, I think that that can also help with quite a bit, uh, and it's not terribly costly. So we have a, a question a little bit. The discussion has started in the chat here, which is which is great. Um, but I know we we don't have the time to get into this discussion uh, here. Uh, the question was, how do people define interoperability? Is it the capacity for one system to transfer data to be shown in another, or is it the ability to link data between systems? Um, and then some of the additional information was, you know, it's not just on the technical side, it's, it's um, such as, inter as APIs, it's also how do you do the collection, what, what are the indicators you use to produce, how do you deal with the identity question, the identification that, that Randy mentioned. And I do want to use a plug right now, um, particularly with this question. Next month's Global Digital Health Network meeting. Uh, is going to be specifically around the interoperability maturity assessment tools. Um, and I think please come back to that uh, question and we'll make sure that there is going to be adequate time for some of these discussions because that's certainly, um, I've, we've all probably been in these discussions of the ex existential question of what is interoperability and when have you achieved it? And I think we're going to push that to next month's presenters to uh, answer that for us. <laughs> Um, do we have any other questions here in the Arlington office uh, to any of the presenters or, or in general around the ED, EIDSR discussion? To jump in now, or any, if, let me check. Um, okay, I think we've covered most of them. Any questions that we didn't get to, I will share with the presenters. Uh, just to note that this session was recorded and uh, the recording will be up on the Global Digital Health Network's website as well as the 
presentation, so please you know, feel free to refer back to that and to share out with any of your colleagues who couldn't attend today. Um, I'm going to let Randy say any, any closing remarks or... Yeah, well, I want to thank my co-presenters. Uh, we, uh, we had a, a little uh, test of this yesterday and it went terribly badly because of the interconnectivity issues, but everything worked out perfectly today. <laughs> and I'm glad for your, thank you, Julianne, for your patience and uh, you've done it, you've all done a great job. I think we've raised some important issues here. And, uh, you know, there's obviously not one answer for, for every situation, um, but it's, it's important to understand a little bit how different countries have, have gotten to where they are. And it's really encouraging to see how far we've come in terms of uh, building some of the functionality of these platforms that we use for disease surveillance. So uh, thank you again. And uh, we'll, we'll yeah. continue to work through the, the network here to share our experiences. Thank you to the Cape Town satellite session for joining us. And just to mention, we had over 70 people um, joining remotely as well as about 20 here in the Arlington office. So it's great to be able to connect um, in, these, in these sessions and please watch for the invitation for the August monthly meeting.